So, what shall we spar about today? Today, we're going to be asking, has capitalism made the world a better place? We're going to be looking at this debate between two groups of economists about global poverty reduction. So, has it happened? How fast has it happened if it has? And can it be attributed to success of capitalism spreading around the world over the last hundred or so years? What we're going to be looking at here is the percentage of people in the entire world who live in extreme poverty going from 100% to 0% and from the year 1820 to 2015. Now, what do we mean by extreme poverty? That's people living on less than $1.90 per day. Now, that figure in 1820 was around 90%. So it started declining fairly slowly, but then at around in the late 1800s, 1900 starts dropping more sharply. After the World Wars, it accelerates even more. So we're now down at around 10%. So this is the central claim made by Gates, Pinker and so on. Absolute poverty has come down during a period when capitalism was spreading around the world. A capitalist system has led to the almost eradication of extreme poverty. I sense some scepticism from you. Well, as you expect, I'm gonna take issue with this claim that living on $1.90 a day is a useful measure uh, of people living in poverty. For example, in the UK, virtually no one lives on that level. The average earnings are more like $100 per day. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that we have no one living in poverty or even extreme poverty in this country. That's yeah. impossible. Yeah, and that's a point that has been made by some of the critics of this argument. So a couple of left-wing economists, uh, including most prominently Jason Hickel, have critiqued this idea of using such a low poverty line. So let's have a look at other poverty lines. This is $1.90 a day. So let's say that we're here now, 1980. Okay, so another one sets the poverty line at $3.20 a day. So 55% more or less here. And it went down... So about, is that 25, I 25 think? 25%. Okay. Okay, so that's a quarter of the world population still living on... $3.20. Yeah. There's another one which is $10 a day and that went from 65% down to about 55. I mean, yes, things have improved. I mean, but it's not as rosy a picture maybe as I wouldn't say Rosa, that. Pinker and $10 and a day is still not a lot. There's a famous line from um, a play that China, in, in this space of time, in fact, went from famine to slim fast. Over a billion people, surely they are distorting somehow these numbers. Is this just China, basically? Okay, we're now going to have a look at a chart which takes the same metric and looks at how does global poverty reduction appear when you look at the entire world and then when you look at the world minus China. So 1981, so we're looking at that more recent period through to 2015, the axis starts at 0% of people in extreme poverty and will go up to 100% again to be consistent. When we look at the entire world, China included, we start off at about 40% there and we've come down to about just under 10%. If we look at the world not including China. So this is the world average without China. Without China. It was initially lower and is now at broadly the same point. Mm. So world minus China. So it's true that when you include China, a billion being lifted out of absolute mm -hmm. poverty has had a big impact. But this isn't just China. The world has got better in terms of, in terms of people being in extreme poverty over the last 35 years. So if we look at the Gini coefficient, the Gini coefficient is um, a measure of inequality. If the world were perfectly equal, it would be at zero, and one is complete inequality. From 1850 to, let's say, the years just before the recession, or just as the re recession started hitting, um, I'm going to look at inequality from, from 0 0.5 to 0 0.7. And what happened is that inequality actually rose. This line alone shows you an inverse trend from what we were mm -hmm. seeing. But I think the process of capitalism which led to this increase in inequality is the same process that lifted 
more than a billion out of extreme poverty. And when you have huge economic growth in capitalism, most of those gains accrue to the people at the top. But if that system also brings, raises, raises everyone by a certain level, then that's still a good thing on net. One way that we measure poverty is to look at the share of the population that lives um, below the average income. Now, even though I would say that's an improvement on the poverty line on $1.90 and so on, I uh, think it's still faulty and I'll show you why. So in the UK, we measure relative poverty by looking at the number of people who live at 60% uh, below the median income. So let's say the median income is £10,000, just plucking a figure out of thin air. We're looking at the number of people that are earning 60% of that, so £6,000. So this is what's happened in the UK. We're looking at before housing costs and after housing costs, number of children who live in poverty. We had a third of kids in this period of time. Now we have 28% of children. Small improvement. Before housing costs, it's a quarter of kids in 95-96. It went down to 17%. In this period, more here, where there was a recession, there wasn't much change. So the government actually acknowledged this and said, well, maybe this measure of poverty, relative poverty, is wrong. It doesn't include whether these kids live in good housing. Uh, whether they live in crime-ridden areas, whether they're performing well in schools, all these things that go beside income and that affect our lives. Now, the problem with this idea is that policymakers didn't like the fact that they wanted to de-link poverty from income. That would have been an issue at the international level because this is how everyone measures poverty. And so this was abandoned. However, one could argue that taking them into account is crucial to assessing whether people who live in extreme poverty are also having a bad quality of life. So this is another argument that the sort of pro-capitalist lobby would make, um, or pro-capitalism lobby, which is that if life expectancy has gone up, then that surely is a sign that the fundamental reason that, that you know, humans exist is is actually, you know, we're, we're getting that right. So I'm gonna do a chart here showing global average from 1960 to 2015. And that has gone up from about 52 to now about 72. That seems to me, again, evidence that global quality of life, global life expectancy, global health, all of these things that this, this indicator captures have steadily increased over that period when capitalism has been spreading across the planet. If we want to stick to the quantitative element of how many years we get to live, there's clearly a sign of improvement. But um, look at what happened in the US, for example, with life expectancy. So they went from 70 in the 1960s, so we're looking at it went up to 80 and then just sort of stalled. And this is despite the fact that health costs in the US went up. And it's one of the only countries where actually life expectancy seems to be declining. And one could argue, not necessarily me, but one could argue that it's rampant capitalism that is doing this to the country I guess and the to sort its of population. Aggressive marketing of opioids. For exactly, example. that's one yeah. element that has clearly had an impact. Again, over the long over the long run there from sixty to twenty fifteen in the US life expectancy has risen, but this recent stagnation and decline is certainly not a good sign. And you know, and the US is the poster child of capitalism. So evidently I and capitalist advocates would have to accept that something there has gone wrong in the last ten years and we're certainly no longer seeing this clear relationship between capitalism, free markets and improvements in in quality and quantity of life. My exhibit A in favour of the argument that capitalism has improved the world was saying that over 200 years, the percentage of people living in extreme absolute poverty has fallen from 90% to 10%. We then looked at the impact of using more reasonable poverty lines. Yeah, and then we see that more than half of the population is still living in poverty globally. So we've, we've which still, is so we still had an improving trend, but it wasn't as quick and it hasn't got as far as was initially claimed. Then we looked at whether this was all China going from famine to slim fast. And we found that it's true that, that China's rapid development has sort of inflated the extent to which it looks like poverty reduction has taken place. But 
even if you take China out of the picture, the percentage of people living in absolute poverty worldwide has still decreased. And then I said, well, if things are so rosy, then how come inequality has gone up? But the, the argument for those who say capitalism has made the world a better place would be that, yes, things have become more unequal, but the same system that produced that increase in equality has also elevated people out of poverty. It's increased their incomes. But money is insufficient because if we look at the example of child poverty in the UK, then we'll see that this measure doesn't explain at all what happened to during the recession, which had a drastic impact on UK society. And we should look at other metrics like health, educational attainment, quality of housing, and general quality of life. And but I said, that's a very good point. Evidence. Let's look at something where money is totally to one side and we just look at how long people live. Globally, there's been a steady and still increasing rise in life expectancy. However, the US, the poster child of rampant capitalism, shows that there is not, not such progress in the last couple of years. Yeah, so I guess with my capitalist hat and monocle on, I would say we have seen an improvements in life expectancy and poverty reduction during the era when, era when capitalism has been expanding across the world. However, I would acknowledge that income-based measures of human development are very limited. And also that if you look at the most capitalist countries in the world, so the likes of the US and the UK, increases in life expectancy have now actually stalled and there's some evidence they may be falling. So even if perhaps the journey to capitalism helped countries, it seems we've hit diminishing returns or even now a fork in the road where capitalism is maybe not And I would utopia. say that in conclusion, Pinker, Gates, so on, haven't quite persuaded me yet.